Good morning, everyone. My name is Joy Connolly, and I'm honored to serve as president of the American Council of Learned Societies. And I'm both honored and happy to welcome you to the second day of our 2021 annual meeting. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to this panel um, on career diversity. This panel signifies the commitment of us at uh, of all of us at ACLS to the value and 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 material real genuine contributions of humanists with PhDs uh, from a, the, all the fields in the humanities and interpretive social sciences outside the bounds of the academy um, in the world and there's no one better to explain this uh, and and moderate this panel uh, on career diversity than. Dr. Fran Ferguson. Uh, Frances Ferguson is president emerita of Vassar College. She served as president of Vassar from 1986 to 2006. And before that, she was provost at Bucknell. Um, she's a veteran of many boards. Her advice and guidance is valued by a range of people from Harvard University to the Mayo Clinic. And we couldn't be happier to have Fran serve on our board. She's a extraordinarily valued member, and she's going to do a wonderful job of introducing the panel and moderating the discussion. So Fran, if I can hand it over to you, thank you so much for your time and wisdom on the board and in this panel this morning. Well, thank you so much, Joy, that was very kind words. And I want to second Joy's welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining our fellows panel this morning. And if you're with us live, I know it's a very early morning for those of you on the West Coast and perhaps no longer morning for any of you that are joining us from other countries. The Fellows Panel is always a wonderful opportunity to hear about the innovative work being done by our grantees. This year, as Joy indicated, we're discussing the crucial role that humanistic knowledge plays in the public arena. Our panelists have taken very different paths of engagement with the world beyond the academy. They'll discuss their ongoing work, three very diverse ways in which the humanities and the interpretive social sciences have helped to shape our communities and public policies and perceptions. The biographies of our panelists were available in the meeting materials and as you may have seen on the screen directly before the start of our presentation. I'll therefore keep my introductions very brief. After each person has spoken, our panelists will have a roundtable conversation on a few questions that I shall pose and which I invite you to pose through the Zoom Q&A function. Feel free to use that at any time during the presentation and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. First, let me briefly introduce our speakers. Our first presenter will be Alondre Dedrick, a two-year ACLS Mellon Public Fellow who has been working as a program officer for leadership programs at the German Marshall Fund. Alandre will be followed by Marissa Lopez, Professor of English and Chicano Studies at UCLA and a 2019 ACLS Scholars and Society Fellow. She will tell us about her work with the LA Public Library on new ways of picturing Mexican Los Angeles. And finally, Dan Threet, a 2019 Mellon ACLS Public excuse me, fellow, will engage us with his work as a research analyst for the National Low Income Housing Co Coalition. So with that, Alondre, please begin. Okay, so I want to use this presentation to talk briefly about the work that GMF uh, Leadership Programs does specifically and essentially the work that I have done uh, essentially building up the Tech for Inclusion initiative, which I was actually asked to do on my very first day of the job. So that was uh, kind of an excellent opportunity to just jump into the deep end. Uh, so I will talk about what it means to think about inclusion, its definition, how we define it, especially in the context of the transatlantic space and region. The German Marshall Fund uh, was founded with the mission of strengthening transatlantic cooperation in the spirit of the Marshall Plan. If we can think back to World War II. Uh, and in that vein, uh, the GMF is headquartered in DC with seven other offices across Europe, including Paris, uh, Bucharest, um, Brussels, Ankara. I won't try to get all seven, I always miss one. Uh, but through that and with the uh, focus on inclusive leadership, I will talk about how we define that and especially how we pay attention to the nuances of differences across the transatlantic space. So uh, next slide, please. 
So to speak a little bit about the Leadership Programs team, the Leadership Programs team is actually different from your typical think tank team in the sense that it does not devote the majority of its time directly to policy research. Instead, the Leadership Programs team runs the suite of fellowship programs that the German Marshall Fund offers. So two of the biggest, well, the biggest and the one that I work on, so the one that we will care about for today, the biggest in our flagship is, of course, the Marshall Memorial Fellowship. The president of France, uh, Emmanuel Macron, is actually one of uh, one of our uh, alumni, as well as Stacey Abrams. And this really, in the MMF, the Marshall Memorial Fellowship, really focuses on, you know, the senior leadership, uh, you know, people who have really spent 10 to 15 years in leadership roles. And we really kind of build up their competencies in the transatlantic space so that they can then kind of use their powers in their networks and expand their networks to really kind of think about what transatlantic cooperation means for their work, wherever that may be. So that's across politics, business, both public and private. And then there's the Transatlantic Inclusion Leaders Network, which I have been working on for the past two years, which actually focuses on up and coming political leaders under the age of 35 across Europe, as well as the United States. And this is a much younger program, about nine years old, that it's a very exciting um, network and a group of young individuals who all are either have political positions or work directly in politics to really push the ne needle of inclusion. So we can go to the next slide. And so these next two slides are just to give kind of a visual overview of kind of where our network is spread out and how large it is. The MMFs, we have over 4,000 now because of the length of the program. It's been about, it's about 40 years old. And we have a few hundred of the TILM program now in its ninth year. So the next slide as well. And so that's uh, across Europe, we're completely spread um, up until you get to Russia, which is not very fun of the German Marshall Fund. We cannot go there. But outside of that, we are very, very prominent throughout the, the European Union. And we've really kind of focused our efforts on the Eastern European area as well. So now we'll get into, next slide, please, get into the work that I've been doing with the inclusive leadership. So one, thinking about how we define inclus inclusion and this being the leadership programs team and the Inclusive Leadership Hub, we think about uh, what inclusion means specifically for leaders. So our argument is that inclusion is a necessary leadership competency in the 21st century for all leaders. And also, in addition to that, leadership itself, if we're thinking about politically as well as across organizations, leadership should also be reflective of the populations being served. So it's twofold in that sense. Leaders themselves must act and behave inclusively, and leadership as a whole should be reflective of the diversity of the society um, that is being led. So, you know, with this mission, we make this case, this very specific case of the need for inclusive leadership for all for all people who want to be leaders. Uh, and then we also really try to uh, garner and create conversations around what does it look like, what does it mean, and what tools are at our disposal to be inclusive leaders, which is where uh, Tech for Inclusion comes in. So Tech for Inclusion, I will go to the next slide. So this is a little bit more just defining inclusion uh, and how we do that in our goal of really promoting social cohesion across the transatlantic space and really leveraging the connections of our various networks to um, do grant funding for various programs that target inclusion across a, a very, very wide uh, range of, of activities. So for our leaders, when we want, and speaking, encouraging our leaders to be inclusive, that's that's across all markers of identity. So we don't limit that to anything. And we actually actively try to think um, outside of the box, you may say, and to really kind of think about and consider axes of diversity that are often talk about, talked about. So we, we talk about kind of like intergenerational differences how and how they affect the workplace and how they affect political conversations. We talk about, you know, uh, differences in nationality, you know, immigration status, religion and what that means in addition to your kind of standard thought about, you know, race, gender, and class. Uh, next slide, please. 
So, yeah, I've really spoke a lot about our approach uh, and the initiative. So we can go ahead to the next slide as well, and then we can get right into uh, Tech for Inclusion. So, yes, yeah, so uh, as I said, on my first day on the job, I was asked to uh, take over the Tech for Inclusion initiative, which culminated in the Inclusive Leadership Summit, the 2020 Tech for Inclusion uh, Inclusive Leadership Summit. And each year we have a summit that, that gets together essentially the entirety of our network, uh, usually in Paris, uh, and we come together to talk about for three days a wide variety of inclusion topics under that theme. So uh, the first year in 2019, when I first started the job, we did our Inclusive Leadership Summit on um, advancing political inclusion. So with Tech for Inclusion, you get the next slide, please. So Tech for Inclusion, we're really thinking about the ways in which our leaders can actively leverage technology to advance inclusion in their own work. So for political leaders, they may be thinking about how they can use tech for civic engagement. For business, for business leaders, they may be thinking about how they can use technology to um, diversify their recruiting and hiring practices. Uh, and also above that, beyond deploying tech, we also think about and have a series of conversations around emerging technologies and what that and the impact of those technologies on our inclusive work. So one of the first events that we had was uh, a roundtable on the impact of facial, recogn facial recognition technology on inclusion work. And this was coming right on the heels of San Francisco outlawing the use of facial, rec facial recognition technology by police and other authorities and really thinking about, well, as inclusive leaders, what does that mean and how should we be thinking about this technology? How should we be thinking about its usage and then what, what, what should be our position in terms of kind of advocacy and especially advocating for kind of the most marginalized. Uh, and as you see here on this slide, <laughs> At first, we were meant to have this uh, summit in person in September uh, in France, and we scattered locations, chose locations and venues. And of course, that did not happen. I just wanted to leave that in there just to acknowledge also just the kind of shift uh, in perspectives as we had to go digital, virtual, and really think about how to have meaningful conversations and meaningful engagements that will lead to um, noticeable outcomes. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, so this is just giving like a very quick rundown of kind of the goals that we had and what we were able to accomplish, you know, bringing the leaders together and having a uh, kind of a a large number of discussions and breakout groups and sessions on um, a, a number of really exciting topics. We can go to the next slide just to give you kind of an example. So designing for an inclusive future, we had um, design tech leaders come and talk about on a panel what that means to think about inclusion and how you can imply design thinking for your inclusion work, civic engagement in the smart city. So just kind of really thinking across all the different fields and industries that our leaders are in and kind of having that discussion and really thinking about the role of technology uh, um, and, and how that shapes their work and how it can really kind of boost their efforts. Uh, and let's see, I know I'm running out of time as well. The next slide. Oh, yes, okay, we're at the end. So I think um, just, just, to, just to wrap it up, uh, one of the, the biggest things that I've learned and the biggest challenge in the, the space is really thinking about the nuances of what inclusion means and having that discussion across Europe and America at the same time when you know all of these groups, all of these countries define race and think about race, ethnicity, religious differences, nationality differences in very different ways and really trying to have a conversation that brings all those people together um, in ways that don't lead to conflict, but actually hopefully conflict res resolution. So um, that concludes my presentation and I will pass it on to Marissa. Uh, hello. And thank you for having me this morning. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. And I'm, I'm here to talk about Picturing Mexican America, which is a cluster of digital humanities projects that I designed and I manage, all of which was made possible by the ACLS, the Scholars and Society Fellowship. So today I'm going to discuss uh, briefly the history of the project uh, and describe some of our current initiatives and our future plans. And I'm going to let you know how to keep up with us and follow us. So I am a professor of English uh, and, I, and Chicano studies, and I study 19th century Mexican-American literature. So until very, very recently, 
My professional identity has been wrapped up in my love of old books and dusty archives, which is I'm sure something that a lot of you can identify with. But a couple of years ago, I have started to get really interested in pictures, in how people conceive and uh, are affected by images and the impact of images on social and political life. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, Th thanks. <laughs> so this started as I was writing my second book, uh, which has a chapter on conceptual photography. Uh, and I was doing a lot of reading, as I was working on that chapter, a lot of reading in the history of photography, the emergence of visual technologies, what it means to see. And I started thinking, as I do, about Californios, about 19th century Mexican Californians. And I wondered what they saw uh, and what impact these emerging technologies like cameras would have had on them, technologies that are emerging at around the same time that this group is coming into prominence and um, waning in significance in, in the politics of California. Uh, next slide. So this is the image, this is the picture that really catalyzed my thinking around this question. So this is a, a picture of Mariano Vallejo's daughters. And he was the Mexican military commander of uh, California at the time of the transfer to US rule in 1848. He was also the most uh, wealthy and powerful man in the state. And I have written a lot about Vallejo. And I came across this image while I was researching in, in his archive in Sonoma. Uh, uh, mission Sonoma in Northern California. He supervised the building of that mission and he has a house nearby. The archive is maintained by the California Department of Parks and Rec. And while I was researching there, I wasn't interested in Vallejo's daughters, but I found this picture so compelling, so weird and creepy. <laughs> and I was delighted that the ranger on duty, just let me take a digital copy. I've had this up in my office and I've been looking at it for years. There's so much going on here, uh, both within and without the frame. Like who's taking this picture and why? Where are they? Why aren't they facing the camera? What do they imagine the viewer is seeing? Are they showing us something or are they refusing to be seen? Next slide, please. So I published an article exploring these questions. The title probably looks familiar. Uh, but even after I wrote this article, I felt like my questions just weren't resolved. And I have come to realize that my questions are not questions that can be resolved via traditional methods of scholarship. Next slide. I was very fortunate that around the same time that I reached this professional crossroads, ACLS rolled out a brand new program, the Scholars and Society Fellowship. And this pulled together several threads that I had been following in my work, especially around career diversity and innovations in doctoral education. So this opportunity catalyzed my thinking as I worked on the application. Because over the years, um, so parenthetically, I'm a super duper history nerd. I love history, tourism, walking tours, that kind of thing. So over the years, I've encountered several different history apps, tools that allow you to explore the history of a place through walking tours or map pop-ups. And I've always thought, hmm, somebody should make something like this for California. Well, when I got this fellowship, I became that person. And I was delighted when the Los Angeles Public Library agreed to partner with me. So together, we're building an app uh, that is going to change users' perceptions of space and make clear the consistent, enduring presence of Latinx people in the United States. Next slide. I want this app to make knowledge, knowledge in air quotes, uh, genuinely public through digital media that uh, profoundly alters the definition and boundaries of the public who have access to and who participate in the public humanities. So what, for example, is the political potential of circulating a map like this that visualizes the deep Mexican history of the land on which UCLA now sits? So how do conversations around equity, um, access, and belonging change when lots of people are looking at something like this? Next slide, please. The Los Angeles Public Library is interested in similar questions. And I had been researching there. I began in, in uh, 2019. And I had been re researching at the library for about six months before COVID shut everything down. And in that time, I learned so much from librarians and staff. So I spent my first couple of months um, having lots of lunches and coffees and conversations and getting to know the people who worked in all different capacities at the library, uh, which is a massive organization. Uh, and these conversations helped me get a handle on the library's work. It helped me uh, clarify the ways in which my project uh, 
as it was developing could align with and support the library's mission to serve the people of Los Angeles. And all of the people I met had lots of interesting ideas about what an app such as I was imagining might look like and do. And so through one of these conversations with um, Edwin Rorate, who's the uh, senior librarian for emerging technologies and collections. So through him, I was connected with volunteers from Hack for Los Angeles, which is a group of civic minded tech professionals who are looking to donate their talents and their free time uh, to projects like mine that benefit the public good. So Edwin introduced me to Lexi Quint and Tim Marine, who've been the key factors in moving Picturing Mexican America from a vague idea to a back-end ready design prototype. Uh, next slide. So in January of 2020, they ran a visioning, visioning workshop with me. Uh, and that, that's a thing that I learned existed, a visioning workshop. Um, so we ran that, uh, we gathered about 20 people together to brainstorm, including academic and public librarians, teachers, K through 12 teachers, students, and other community stakeholders, activists. We also had some design students there who built this, which you're looking at a front end prototype for an app based on conversations from that day. So at the same time, uh, my work on the app has spawned lots of branches. So where I used to just say, I'm building an app. Uh, now I describe picturing Mexican America the way I did at the top of this presentation uh, as a cluster of digital projects. So you can find picturing Mexican America now on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. But we are most active on Instagram. So if you're on that platform, you should definitely follow us there to keep up with us and see some of the very cool material, some of which uh, you've seen in this presentation uh, that will one day be in our app. And our, our mission, and, and when I say our, I mean the researchers and writers, mostly students of graduate and undergraduate uh, students working with me on this. So our mission is to circulate archival material, to free it from wherever it's being ignored and to get as many eyes on it as we can in order to start conversations. So our focus is on Mexican Los Angeles, but we are also invested in illuminating how diverse Los Angeles has always been and emphasizing how important cross-racial solidarity and collaboration is in our various struggles for social justice. So that diversity and solidarity is the focus of the next major collaboration that I'll be working on in 2021 with A26LA. Now, now we'll look at the next slide, A26LA. So my fellowship includes $15,000 in post-fellowship year programming funds, most of which I will be spending here at A26LA, which is a local chapter of a national nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting students ages uh, six through 18 with their creative and expository writing skills. So together, We'll be designing a series of K through 12 programs. Uh, the first of which is happening next week. So next slide, please. Uh, it's happening next week. Uh, and these programs are built around uh, some of the archival material that I'm pulling from the library. So the plan is this, this is the first one. Uh, and the plan is for me to be able to replicate these workshops, uh, you know, variations on a theme at branch libraries throughout Los Angeles. Uh, using undergraduate students from UCLA as instructors and, and making these workshops be really site specific to the land, um, the Mexican history of the land around the branch library. Uh, so another Picturing Mexican America project that you can explore on your own, even without Instagram, is this one. Uh, next slide, please. We have teamed up with a group called the Los Angeles Explorers Club to produce a series of self-guided bike tours. Uh, the first one we did is Daily Life in Early Los Angeles. Because Los Angeles in the 19th century was, uh, as John McFargar describes it in Eternity Street, a, I'm quoting, violent place in a violent time. But nevertheless, people still managed to have a lot of fun uh, in LA. So what did early Angelinos do to entertain themselves? What do entertainment, popular culture, and daily life in the 19th century reveal about the racial and ethnic tensions in Los Angeles today in 2021? So that's those are the questions that our ride explores. And we just released a second ride all about Arcadia Bandini, uh, which focuses on the west side of, of Los Angeles and Santa Monica. Next slide. Next and final slide. So you can find us on all the channels, all the places, or you can sign up to receive updates at picturingmexicanamerica.com. And in closing, I just want to say that my work on this project on picturing Mexican America has been a gift, and I take seriously the responsibility to pay it forward by creating opportunities for my graduate students and pushing for departmental and institutional change around how we perceive and evaluate publicly engaged work. It has been a gift to think with other people 
in a different way about how and why stories are important, how they empower, how they build bridges, foster solidarity, and inspire people to create. So one of the things that I'm most looking forward to post-COVID is returning to LAPL Central Branch. Because walking into that building always fills me with joy and hope. And I know we're all going to feel that again soon. And I'm so grateful to ACLS for the opportunity to partner with the library on this project aimed at circulating joy and hope beyond the library's walls and inspiring people to create a better tomorrow. Thank you. I will go ahead and take up the mantle. Thanks, Marissa. That's a tough act to follow, Alondre and Melissa. Those are both fascinating presentations. So first, I, I want to thank the, the ACLS for the opportunity to reflect here on my experience as a Mellon ACLS public fellow for the last two years and to create this space to think about what public engagement can mean for humanists, uh, and particularly how doctoral programs in the humanities can position their graduates to contribute to the, the common good, whether in academic or non-academic roles. As you might have seen from my, my bio, I'm a political philosopher by training. At Georgetown, I worked on theories of distributive justice with a particular emphasis on social equality and informal interaction. And as I understand it, political philosophy is engaged in the business of critically examining the normative vocabulary of our political discourse, whether that's through working through the, uh, the assumptions that underlie common arguments, uh, clarifying important but vexed concepts like liberty, power, fairness, uh, and tracing out the implications of um, arguments that um, aren't always obvious in the, the hurly-burly of engaged debate, to steal a line from Philip Pettit. From that vantage point, you might think that public engagement is a given, but it actually takes a lot of work to translate often abstract academic ideas uh, into forms that are immediately useful for the public. I think one common model of public engagement as a humanist, especially what I see among academic philosophers, are pieces of writing that um, uh, are designed for the broader public, whether through op-eds, articles, or books that seek to shed light on issues that are popping up in popular discourse by applying an academic's expertise. I think my experience um, as someone now working fully outside the academy, it embedded uh, in the public policy world, as it were, um, provides another way of thinking about that kind of public engagement. So my, my public fellowship has been as a research analyst at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Uh, we're a, a research and advocacy organization dedicated solely to achieving uh, public policy that ensures that the renters with the lowest incomes in the United States have access to decent, affordable housing. The coalition was instrumental in the creation of the National Housing Trust Fund, which is uh, our country's only funding tool that is designed specifically to spur production of housing that is affordable for renters with what are called extremely low incomes. And more generally, I, I think it's fair to say that the coalition is relentlessly reminding the public of the, of the moral priority of the least well off. Even if you're not familiar with housing policy, uh, you're likely at least indirectly familiar with the coalition's work uh, because every summer we release a report that gets wide coverage in the local news media uh, because we put a dollar figure on what someone needs to earn hourly in order to afford rent in their area. Needless to say, it's been a, a tremendous education to work alongside advocates who've been on the front lines of housing policy for decades to learn the intricacies of that policy space uh, and to leap into public engagement in a new way. So uh, as part of this conversation, I just wanna uh, identify a few highlights of that public engagement and some of the lessons that I've drawn from it. First, I've been one of the principal authors in the last few years of the coalition's two flagship annual publications, The Gap and Out of Reach. Uh, uh, after this, I'll, I'll drop links to those reports in the chat. And in that capacity, I've performed analysis that's been taken up by uh, advocates across the country who are fighting for more resources for affordable housing in their communities. The gap provides an estimate of the shortage of affordable and available homes for the lowest income renters in the country uh, at the national level for every state and for the largest 50 metropolitan areas. 
the report makes the case for our policy arguments. So it needs to have uh, the, the rigor to convince legislators and the accessibility to, to draw in uh, a lay or public audience. That work involves extensive use of statistical software that I wasn't trained in as a philosopher. And it was through the ACLS program that I was uh, able to take a first semester methods course uh, in an MPP program, which has made that work more tractable. But in, in addition to the, the statistical analysis, which forms a bedrock for those reports, drafting those reports has given me a chance to bring, I think, a uniquely philosophical skill set to bear. Because the framing of those reports requires uh, an appeal to moral and political values. Uh, policy arguments always ride on um, unspoken normative judgments and normative concepts that we share. And it's been a real pleasure to think about what justice demands and what we mean when we talk about justice inside this very concrete context. Now, these reports are the products of, of months of labor and deliberation um, in compiling public resources, carefully cleaning data, thinking long and hard about uh, how the text will explain difficult concepts to new audiences. And the principal audience uh, for that text and those reports are often people who are harried, uh, working under deadlines, looking for bullet point summaries. This, this great literature does have a wide dissemination, though, and an audience keen to learn. So an important part of my role there has been um, as a point person for technical communication of that research, explaining the significance of those findings and how we got there um, in a variety of fora, in briefings for congressional staff, in TV and radio interviews, congressional or uh, regional conferences, um, closed door meetings and uh, with major financial institutions, universities, uh, and even with some members of the faith-based community. They're all eager for data, but they are equally in need of historical context, narrative framing, uh, and a normative vocabulary to understand the significance of that research. So through that, that technical communication, we steadily build small victories in shaping public consciousness about the housing affordability crisis, whether that be through uh, local news stories or through shaping a presidential candidate's platform. And just this week, I've been asked to explain our research uh, and our analysis for local news media in a Midwestern metro where there's uh, an ongoing debate about how much needs to be done for the lowest income renters uh, in their community. Second, and I think this connects to some themes that Alondre and Marissa have identified about the need to rethink and reshape some of our work in the course of the last year. I think this has probably been true for all of us more specific to the, the phenomenal horror of the last year. Um, I've also been deeply enmeshed in our COVID-related work. So at the outset of the pandemic, my colleagues and I produced some rapid response uh, estimates of the need for emergency rental assistance, which were taken up in conversations on the Hill. And in the intervening months, we've worked to shine a light on the, the kind of suffering that we could see if people are thrown out of their homes at the end of an eviction moratorium. That requires a good deal of imagination as well as technical expertise uh, brings to bear a, a variety of skills to try to make that those issues salient in, um, in different reports. It's hard to measure success in, in that kind of context, I think, but I do believe that our work has played an important role in winning support for nearly $47 billion in emergency rental assistance that have been allocated in the last five months. I've learned a few things from that continuous public engagement. First, I see now more than ever the importance of good distillation, which is not only a practical necessity, it's also something that demands a lot of care, um, not just for rhetoric, but for real ethical work, I think. Second, and, and relatedly, uh, I've seen the tremendous need for uh, context and framing in public advocacy, the kinds of reflective deep work that we do in the humanities. One truism about public policy uh, is that the pace is unforgiving. And there's rarely time to stop and think about our history in detail, about the everyday details of lives that are affected, or the fundamental values that motivate and inform our work. But good public advocacy uh, requires all those kinds of work too, not just as a tool for the, those of us who have a message, but as a kind of spur for social deliberation. 
Finally, I've come to an appreciation of the idea that public engagement needs to be thought about as an ongoing long-term project of relationship building. Um, most public interventions do not dramatically reshape public consciousness, but the cumulative effects are important too. I think it's already clear from uh, what I've just said, how I see the work of humanists impacting communities outside the academy. Um, as an ethicist, I think the humanities play a, a really vital role in uh, exploring and clarifying and calling attention to questions of value, what's important, what we care about, how to think about uh, and define matters that are important for individual and collective well-being, but which often sits so close as to be inscrutable on a daily basis. Um, and I think done well, scholarship in the humanities and the, the public facing work of humanists more generally, I think helps situate those uh, important public and political conversations. Uh, and I'll stop there and turn things back over to Fran. Thank you so much for those three wonderful reports. I think you'll agree that those presentations of how humanist studies can have significant impact in the public sector have been extremely interesting. From Alandre's international work on diversity and inclusion to Marissa's re-imaging of Mexican America and Los Angeles, and to Dan's very important impact on critical public policies. We're now gonna have a few questions and discussions among uh, our panelists. I, I think Dan uh, very nicely pointed out the uh, extraordinary uh, shift in thinking and, and work that needs to take place to take what happens in academe into the public sector and make it understandable and, and lucid and important for that. So, and it's clear that I think increasing numbers of PhD recipients are likely to find their careers outside academe. And yet most PhD programs are educating doctoral students to become academicians and they seeming ha seemingly have less interest, uh, less knowledge and less value perhaps placed on positions in the public sphere. Um, to all four of you, do you see ways that this can change? And perhaps um, one of our questions that came from the audience, how can graduate education be developed to train PhDs to disseminate research and concepts to a general population? Um, who would like to start? Would you like to start with that one, Dan? That's for sure. I, I, I have some thoughts about that. Um, obviously, no, no, no uh, quick and easy solutions. But one thing that I think is really valuable um, in that process is maintaining networks with graduates who do not go on to academic positions. Um, so I, I know that many departments are, are now doing a better job of uh, providing a robust placement record that accounts for the variety of careers that uh, graduates go into. Uh, but it's still the case that many who leave a program before they finish, or, or even some who don't go on into academic work, don't have the same kinds of continuing connections to their department. But I think access for current students to those graduates is just as important for learning uh, what's possible uh, learning uh, how those graduates continued to develop and learn and make those transitions. Um, and I, I think that's something that the professoriate are, are not well positioned to really offer advice on in many cases. Uh, so that, that would be one place I would start. I guess the second thing I would say there is that I, I think it's important uh, not to track students into academic or non-academic um, uh, tracks, as it were, in a PhD program too early in the process for two reasons. One, because the, the PhD program itself can be transformative. Uh, and even if some students come in thinking, uh, I, I'm only aiming at a teaching job or I have no interest in a teaching job, five to seven years in a, in a PhD program can change that dramatically. But also for those who uh, still go on into academic work, I think it's important that uh, programs are designed in ways that still leave open the option of thinking of uh, careers as a continuum rather than thinking about having being fully committed to an academic uh, career and thinking that nothing else is now open because I've only been thinking about that for five to seven years. So that doesn't offer formula, uh, but I think it offers a kind of goal. Very good. Marissa, would you like to speak to that? Yes, my enthusiastic nodding <laughs> is suggested as much. I just want to second everything that Daniel said uh, and add two concrete things um, that are, are things that I've been working on in, in my own um, department in English. Uh, 
you know, I do a lot of work around experiential and engaged learning at the undergraduate level and have been trying to develop a graduate level course or even a mixed graduate undergraduate level uh, experiential learning course that would give graduate students the opportunity to, to think about classroom work in relation to work in the, in the public sector. Uh, and so I think that that is one thing that departments can pursue thinking about having experiential learning count towards degree requirements for the PhD uh, to make it seem like a, a meaningful and significant and important part of their education. And another thing that we had done for a while in English when we had funding from the Mellon Foundation was summer, uh, summer funding for uh, graduate students to pursue non-academic internships that were in some way related to their research, but that weren't, you know, I am going to an archive and doing dissertation research, but that uh, uh, required them or asked them to make connections with uh, an organization in LA or beyond and, and to provide work for them. And we, we funded that at the same level as our grad division offers summer funding for research fellowships. And that was an incredibly successful program for which we no longer have any money. Uh, so that's, I'm, I'm trying to find funding for that. Uh, it was transformative for students in a lot of ways, generative for their research. And then I would say probably about a third of our students uh, went on to pursue non-academic careers that were related to the uh, internship that they had done with us. So that's another, so two concrete things. It's interesting because it's always been a mantra in undergraduate education that anyone can do anything with a liberal arts education. Uh, and I think that, you know, we've at the undergraduate level provided lots of those internships and volunteer opportunities to develop people's interests in the public sector. But that seems to disappear in large part when people get to graduate school. So it's very encouraging to hear that that's been happening at UCLA. Um, Alondre. Yeah, and no, I completely agree with everything that uh, Daniel and Marissa said. I think those are great ideas. The only thing that I would add, just in my time and what I've been doing over the past two years as a program officer, you know, really thinking about programming, <laughs> programming events, is really about being mindful about the people that you bring to conversations. And, and I was really thinking about this, about what Daniel said, is really like seizing the opportunity that departments have. I mean, just thinking back and all the flashbacks of every single week, all the brown bags and colloquia you go to, but everyone you go to, you're talking to academics, and that, that's actually an opportunity to bring in voices outside of academia and expand the conversation, and that, that, that that's something that that's just, you know, kind of very rote into the department practices and the department life when we actually are in person. And so really thinking about that and just being really mindful about how you shape conversations and who you bring to those conversations. And that would expand so much thinking and especially just the possibilities because so often going into a PhD program, um, not only does, does, is it transformative over the, the six, seven or more years, but also a lot of times you come in thinking that it's only possible to do academia or even outside of academia, there are only a couple of options, right? So going into anthropology, it's like, well, even if I don't go into academia, an anthropologist could only then do maybe X, Y, or Z when actually you could do a million things. And so it's about opening your eyes to that and bringing more people into those conversations that you have on a weekly basis to show that to the students. Uh, do any of you feel that your ACLS sponsorship of your work has helped to change perceptions uh, from your graduate uh, mentors of what is important and what you've been able to do? In other yeah. words, does that stamp of approval make a difference or are they still very skeptical? I just want to, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I uh, was... Um, just promoted to full. So I'm in a slightly different place. My graduate mentors, I mean, I'm still in touch with, but you know, I am seeking approval from my senior colleagues at this point. Um, and the ACLS, like the Scholars and Society Fellowship was like, it was key. It was, it was key in moving me up to this next plateau. I mean, this is work that I want to be doing. I would not have pursued it uh, if I had not had this fellowship opportunity, first of all, for the, the time and the money. But also I, I might not have pursued it in the same way because I know that my colleagues are, are skeptical. But the, the, the imprimatur of the ACLS makes it seem like real and weighty and that's something that they, even if they don't want to pay attention to it or even if they may think like, ha, 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 it's not a monograph, uh, they they have to because they, they have to pay attention to it and they have to take it seriously because ACLS is. So it's like a little, uh, like a red flag to them. Like, oh, 
maybe we're missing something. Uh, and it was it, absolutely, this funding was the, the deciding factor in A, making me pursue this work and B, making it seem like something my department had to take seriously, even if they did not want to. I have a, a slightly different experience to share there, uh, just because my department at Georgetown has historically been, um, I think, a global leader in uh, biomedical ethics. And so there is already a kind of applied uh, orientation. And many of our graduates go on to work as internists or bioethicists outside the academic world. So instead, for me, I think the imprimatur of the ACLS, as Marissa was saying, was more important. I, I think I, I've seen that impact more actually outside the academic world, uh, because it, it conveys a, the kind of seriousness of the academic community, the thinking about how diversely uh, those skills can be applied. Um, and so it was an, an entree into conversations in public policy that I don't think I would have had before. Um, and I think through my own work as um, a public fellow, I, th I think I've probably opened some eyes in other organizations about the value of the kind of skills that uh, humanists can bring to the table. Andre? Yes, no, that, that just gave me a flashback actually. Well, one of my advisors, when I told them that I was no longer thinking about or going into academia, she looked at me and she said, oh, I just always thought of you as such an intellectual. And I, I, and I immediately, <laughs> which I guess is nice to hear that from your advisor. But I also, of course, immediately, I can't be an intellectual and not have a job in academia. <laughs> Can those things not both be true? Um, but since, you know, um, I think with the work that I've done, especially around the inclusion work and especially around thought leadership, they, the, the team really needed someone and they actually had an ACLS fellow but prior to me, which is why they were so excited to have another one to really have, well, you're the PhD, take on thought leadership and do the writing. And because in leading that effort and really kind of bulking up the thought leadership output of the team um, really got my mentors and, and, and folks on board when they saw kind of like the research that, that I was able to lead on the team, especially kind of looking at the diversity efforts of the U.S. State Department and Foreign Service. So that kind of gave it more heft. You know, when, when, once I was interviewing ambassadors, then I was like, oh, OK, well, that's good. <laughs> It's, it's interesting, Jim Grossman, who is the uh, executive director of the American Historical Association, uh, pointed out to me in, uh, in uh, the question and answer uh, function that the American Historical Association has been doing a lot of work uh, to try to introduce some of the exact things that you're all calling for at this point. Uh, historians and uh, in my own field, our art historians have traditionally had more difficult times finding positions as academics and have often been in many other fields. And you know, in my, in my field, museum work, uh, historic preservation, uh, et cetera. So it's, uh, it's really essential, I think, that uh, almost every discipline today begin to think of these very good ways in which value is given to work outside of the academy and preparation is uh, put into place for people to be able to do that effectively. All of you have, I really noticed how important it is to be able to translate what you do and to bring the skills that you have into the public sector. And I think it's really quite extraordinary. So thank you for all that. There's a couple of questions that are quite specific here. So um, let me just find one here. Uh, here's one for you, Alondre. Um, uh, one individual uh, has said, uh, in working with the European Research Council, I've been frustrated because European nations and the European Union refuse to include race or ethnicity in any consideration of inclusion. The only diversity issue that they're willing to deal with is gender and age. How can you convince European politicians and governmental organizations in countries where it's illegal to collect data on race, religion, ethnicity, et cetera, to become more inclusive in terms of race, religion, and so on? So you just brought up the biggest issue that we have. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally the biggest issue that we have. And especially like if you um, take in France, for example, where you literally cannot uh, collect, especially on a kind of a, a state institutional level, um, kind of information broken down by race. It's actually one of the things that we try to have conversations around to push the needle on so that so we're actually actively advocating for the collection of those types of data. So that, that, that's one of the most kind of like basic things that we push with our political network. And this is also 
um, kind of one of the great reasons, um, kind of one of the reasons why it's great that the Inclusive Leadership Hub is based outside of our Paris office, because we actually, you know, are able to sit down with a lot of the leaders to kind of convince and push the needle. But the problem is that it is a lot, a lot of pushing, and there's a lot of pushback. Um, if you can think back, I know it's hard now, especially with the pandemic, but right around the beginning of the pandemic, there was a big um, issue um, around Islamophobia. Uh, in France. And there was a huge discussion, lots of think pieces written about it. And also France got angry with a couple of American um, outlets, right, and how they were framing Islamophobia in France. Uh, and this became a huge issue in GMF because there was a rift in thinking about it and thinking about these issues and how you should approach them from Americans versus Europeans and especially French. For, for And and it, it's it's actually... I think a lot of times, unfortunately, because it, we're working with such a large space and there's so many countries to keep in mind, uh, a lot of times we defer to kind of the inclus uh, uh, inclusive mindset of the leaders to avoid some of the stickiness of, you know, really nailing down and forcing a conversation on race and then and then you also, which is compounded by GMF's internal issues around race and diversity as one of two black people that are that have like prominent roles within the organization. So there are lots of conversations that are compounded both by issues internally to the organization and then by the fact that when you want to have these conversations around inclusion, you don't want them bogged down in conflict. So a lot of times you find ways to go around it. So um, I'm sorry if that doesn't completely answer the question, but it, it really is kind of like the stickiest part and what we're actively trying to move the needle on in terms of getting Europeans and a, a couple of countries and spe specifically to kind of see things similarly. Here's another interesting question for all of you, I think. Um, even graduates who do go into academic positions are likely over the course of a long career to be challenged to assume leadership positions within the profession and increasingly outside uh, this, this particular person said they had no leadership training in graduate school, but acquired it as an army officer. So should graduate education, in addition to disciplinary training, also focus on preparing people for leadership within as well as without the profession? Uh, Dan, sounds like a natural for you to start with. I was, I was just thinking, actually, that's a natural for Alondra, given his work on leadership. But uh, yeah, I, I, I do think there are a couple of things there. One, I think there are lots of opportunities to start developing the soft skills that are really valuable in those positions uh, through um, extracurricular involvement in uh, the life of, of a department. Um, so if in, in my instance, it was in uh, developing a pedagogy group and managing uh, the organization of that, working as a representative in department meetings, um, so forth and so on. So I think in terms of of those skills, I think a lot of that can be cultivated. Um, and the opportunities obviously will vary by discipline. In terms of um, other experience um, reaching out into the community uh, during an, an academic program, I think that's that's worth thinking about and looking for those kinds of opportunities in the local area. But uh, I don't have uh, much more to add to that yet. Good, good food for thought though. Marissa, would you like to add to that at all? Yeah, I think, um... I, I, I second everything again. <laughs> I second second uh, what Daniel is saying. Um, but also, I think departments need to find ways to uh, uh, opportunities for students to be mindful about what they are pursuing and not mindful, like careful, but mindful to be thinking about like, okay, I am going to take on this group and and what does this mean, right? Like, how how do I want to run it? How can I run it effectively? But you know, to to make leadership be a thing, which often is um, is not something like whoever asked this question probably had experiences similar to my own. I didn't actually think about leadership as its own sort of category of intellectual inquiry until I was thrust into leadership positions and not doing a very good job. Uh, so I think departments can do that through, you know, things like pro seminars, right? The first year pro seminar, which often is just a like, 
let's meet different members of the department, but could also have elements of, okay, like think, how do you want to make the most of your time here, right? You can do X, Y, and Z thing. And when you pursue these things, here's what you can be thinking about, right? So students should be encouraged to take on different kinds of leadership positions and pursue different kinds of volunteer opportunities inside and outside the academy, but they should be encouraged and we should also explain why and also help them make the most of those experiences. And if we can't do that as a department, which is the kind of pushback you always get from colleagues, like, you know, A, I don't care, I'm busy writing my next book, or, you know, B, like, I don't know how to do that, uh, then fine, like, we need to learn how to um, create partnerships with other units on campus that can't do that, right? Like the Career Center or, you know, other places. So we can actually say to our students, maybe you should think about these things. I can't really help you think about these things. Go here, right? be proactive and develop yourself here. Is there anything curricularly we should be doing in that regard? Uh, yes, I, I think, and, and this is something we're working on at UCLA, we, we did redo our first year pro seminar. So it wasn't a, you know, meet all the faculty thing. It definitely has more career development um, stuff in it, but uh, you can have, I think all of this has to happen curricularly in pro seminars that are targeted to benchmarks in your program, like benchmarks in the degree progress. So right now we have the first year pro seminar, then we have a pro seminar for uh, students who are working on their dissertation prospectus or a first chapter, right? So that kind of middle uh, stage, uh, that's both a, a writing workshop and helping them with the degree progress and then has um, more career development content. And then we have another course on the books that's that's my next um, frontier is, you know, the publishing workshop that's supposed to help them get an article out, which is, is important and it should still do that. But then those are students that are at later stages of their careers in the PhD program that are, you know, that's an ideal time to start thinking about the wide range of your career options. So that course needs to also have this kind of content. But if we have those in the curriculum, like that is what is key uh, in it's key to have it be part of the curriculum. It cannot be extra. And I, I speak from experience because when it's extra, uh, students don't do it because they, one, they will say like, I don't have time. I'm so busy. It's, everything is overwhelming, which is not, not true. Uh, but also they are getting the message implicitly that it's not important, that the department doesn't care. But if it's a class that they can take, even if it's not required, then that sends the signal, like the department cares about these things, the department thinks this is important and so should you. Right, I think Alondra, you, you're somebody who uh, put yourself into a real leadership position uh, directly from philosophy, uh, PhD. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what that involve you. I think those some, some of us who've taken on leadership positions over the years usually did it by mistake in some ways. You know, we didn't mean to, but we ended up uh, doing something in a, in a um, uh, leadership form of committees and then moving on to other types of things. And we kind of learned it along the way. How did you learn it, Alondre? Yeah, I, I think um, being able to, you know, get this position on the leadership programs team and then being given a lot of leadership um, <laughs> a task of once on the team, both kind of stems to kind of how I framed myself and kind of how I understood my own dissertation research. You know, as an anthropologist doing my field work in Marseille on its urban renewal, I actually really focused on like a lot of anthropological work. Um, I actually did not focus on kind of marginalized group, I actually focused on the people who were kind of running the show and really sought to look at kind of like the fashion industry specifically to look at the business leaders and the relationship between the, the business leaders and the political leaders to really kind of make, to remake Marseille. And so I've just been kind of always looking at and, and kind of studying how people in those leadership roles act and behave and what, what's the impact of that on the people who are led. Uh, and so in, in thinking about you know, what Daniel and Marissa were saying is that a lot of the opportunity, there, there's so many various opportunities. I remember you know, being a graduate rep just because no one else in the department wanted to, to be. So I, I will be the rep, I will go to the meetings. And that became a leadership position. I actually advocated, this is why I was at the new school, I got to advocate for gender neutral bathrooms and they ended up putting in gender neutral bathrooms on campus. That was great, that was that was some leadership. And, and at Stanford, there, there were lots of opportunities but they were always kind of volunteer. So if you volunteer, you can be on the committee that plans the brown bags. If you volunteer, you can be on, you can sit in um, on the faculty meetings and like take notes and disseminate 
to, 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 to the rest of the students, but it was always voluntary. And I, there, there was never any encouragement. There was never any active encouragement. It's like, oh, there's an opportunity if you want to do it. And so, of course, that lead, that lends itself to the people who are kind of those active, I do everything and I want to take on this and I want to take on, I was never that, I, I want to do my work. And when I, was, so I was like, I'm leaving. I, I was at class. I'm going to go do this work and then go to bed. <laughs> but I think if it was more kind of like actively promoted as leadership training and not just, well, if you're a really eager beaver, if you're a really eager student, it always felt like that. It, it felt like the same high school. Oh, do you want to be class president? And it's like, well, no, I'm actually not. I don't have that much school spirit. And, and, it, and it still had that feeling to it as opposed to, hey, you know, you're a graduate student. And by being on the brown bag committee, that's actually really useful experience where you will gain experience. You can put that on a resume, put that on a CV. And it was just never framed that way. And I think just that alone could go a bit further. And then just expanding those opportunities to sit in and kind of gain that experience and seeing what it's like to actually plan things, especially and then be in charge of that, which actually I didn't get until I was actually thrust into the position and then having to kind of create my first round table and then seeing what that meant and what that looked like. Yeah, I think that's a, a very common pattern where people acquire leadership, as you say, you know, through just a cumulative series of things that you agree to do over time. Uh, we have one comment on leadership, which is the individual commends a program an American university offers at the undergraduate level on ethics and leadership led by a cohort mate of Dan's from Georgetown philosophy. So uh, that sounds like a good thing that might be good at the graduate level as well as the undergraduate level. Uh, we're coming towards the end of our time. One individual points out that there are tons of people who are intellectuals out there um, that uh, you know can we remember that there are many, many people who aren't academics who are indeed intellectuals. Uh, and we need to think of the idea of bringing voices from outside academia into our academic conversations. So it requires looking outside into the community who seek to see who should be engaged in those discussions rather than just receiving the wisdom of our fellow academics, which is, I think, uh, an interesting issue too. Uh, we really are at uh, pretty much the end of our time. I'd like to ask if anybody has any last comments that they'd like among our panelists here. Marissa, Dan. No, I'll just say thanks for this opportunity. This has been a really rewarding conversation. It's, it's been very, very interesting, I think, for me to hear everything that you've had to say and the incredible work that you're doing. So uh, with that, I would like to thank the panelists for this very stimulating conversation and, and the attendees for their excellent questions. I wish we could have gotten to more of them. The ACLS has a goal of encouraging scholars and scholarship that's responsive to a diverse audience. Our conversation this morning is a wonderful example of work that brings humanistic inquiry to a variety of cultural, community-based, and policy organizations outside academia. And we look forward to following Dan's work and Alandre's work and Marissa's work in the years ahead. Uh, the next session is going to begin at 11.30. There are six breakout sessions from which you can choose. Each session will focus on a specific topic and the recommendations uh, developed over the past 10 months by the executive director of our member societies, we encourage participation of all the attendees to strategize on how best to carry them out. Uh, the six breakout sessions, as Joy mentioned, are offered twice, so you can have the opportunity to discuss two different topics. So once again, uh, this concludes our fellows panel, and I want to thank you all for being part of a very important discussion.